Unmute. That's the point. There you go. Now, can you hear me? If you can hear me, can you please just write something? Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, there is no, no Zoom meeting that doesn't start with a <laughs> probabilistic, you are a mute. Great. So instead of thinking of, as I was saying, sorry, let me say it for those who are online, this is, I'm going to talk about diagrammatic reasoning, and diagrammatic reasoning is a formal mathematical uh, reasoning. It's a, it's a mathematical technique. It's uh, as rigorous as linear algebra, it just looks different. Uh, the major shift from linear algebra or set theory or other sort of traditional algebraic methods to diagrammatic reasoning is that instead of thinking about the inside of a system, of a physical system, its states, how you transform them. So the unitary matrices, for example, for quantum systems, you try to look at the outside and you ask, how do the transformations that I care about compose? And then you try to reason about that. So you try never to open the transformations until you really have to. Instead of thinking, okay, I have a, a quantum system, it has a state, uh, which is going to be something like this, or I have a unitary matrix, which is going to be something like this. That's looking inside the objects. You Here you look from the outside and you say, okay, what is a state? What is a transformation? There is a, a general language that we use. We say that really there are systems that live in wires. There's wires that denote the existence of a system, a qubit, for example, and transformations are ways of transforming what's in these wires. So for example, a state is a way of putting something in a wire. You look at one zero, the uh, zero state of the computational basis for a qubit, for example, you should not really think of its coordinates. You should just think this is a recipe to produce something in a wire. So you change its appearance and you look at something like this, for example. And in these diagrams, there's different conventions, but I'm gonna pick a convention by which ideally quantum systems or time is flowing from bottom to top, but you can use a quantum circuit convention and make them flow left to right. I will tell you when I change, but it's gonna be pretty obvious, like either vertical wires or horizontal wires, you're going to be able to tell. But for now, let's start with bottom to top because it's sort of the more physics-y uh, perspective. And what is a box? Well, it's a box is something that has a qubit coming in. So let's say that this is a qubit and there's a qubit coming out of it and something happens to the qubit in between. So we denote these transformations as boxes. And for now, I'm just gonna put labels, but later on, I'm gonna introduce some special notations for some of these boxes that we use more frequently. Uh, that's the basic building block, really. There are boxes and there are wires. Wires carry information and boxes do something to that information. Wires carry physical systems and boxes are physical transformations. There are different theories that work with these kind of notations. The semantics of the boxes and the wires really depends on your application. So you can do set theory with them, then the wires are sets and the boxes are functions. You can do most of mathematics this way. Uh, you can, in the case of quantum theory, Technically, the space of states is a set, but it's an infinite set. So you don't want to think of it as having all these many, infinitely many points. Uh, and your transformations are not just functions. They are linear functions, unitary functions. And so you want to, again, abstract away some of the details. And from this perspective, you don't really have to do any abstraction because you always start from the top. You start from the top and refine rather than constructing the underlying sets and trying to forget the structure that you had. So it's sort of a top-down approach rather than a bottom-up approach. You can take many of these boxes, and I think the most basic operation uh, that you can do is that you can wire them together. So you have a bunch of boxes, and, and you can, these boxes have various inputs and outputs. So let's say that this one has one output, one input, two, two, to one, let's take something like this. Uh, these are three different boxes. I don't yet know what they do, it doesn't matter. Uh, the idea is whenever you have an output, you can connect it to an input. In fact, you can also connect uh, outputs to outputs, input to in inputs to inputs. It depends on the semantics. If you think of these as physical operations, then they typically have to flow in one direction, but there are exceptions. And the only point that you um, the only thing that you have to satisfy is that these 
inputs and outputs have some type. So they have, there's some kind of system in there. There's some kind of information and that type is important. You're saying I have a box that takes a qubit and returns a qubit. So let's take that this is a qubit. Actually, I'm just going to use the dimension for now because so this is a qubit and returns a qubit. Let's say that this box takes a qubit and a qtrit and returns a qubit and a qtrit. And this takes uh, two qubits, returns two qubits from a qubit, something like that. Now, I cannot connect the output from this box that has a qtrit to the input of this other box that has a qubit in it. So they have different type. That's the only rule, really. You can connect things any way you want, except when they have different types. So the endpoints of a wire, if you will, have to be whatever they are. You can connect the wires if they're equal, and you cannot connect the wires if they're different. So you can attach them together if A is equal to B, and you cannot attach them together if A is different from B. And that's it. So this is really just bookkeeping. The types are a way of keeping track of what you can and cannot do. Anything which is a valid conjunction of these wires, any wiring, if you will, is a valid box or diagram because it's a composite. Uh, but then I'll tell you that really you can make diagrams into boxes again and, and so on. So you can connect like that. You can take this wire and pull it up. You can take this wire and pull it down. And you can connect something like this. Like this. And now I have a bunch of boxes connected by wires. And I can think of this as, if you are familiar with the notion of tensor network in quantum, quantum theory, you can think of these individual boxes. They're kind of like tensors. And you have attached legs to legs. That's kind of like contracting the axis of some tensors. But physically, it is really a way of saying something comes out and you plug it in. So I think it's more intuitive and more general to just think, OK, I have something is coming out of a box, and I just plug it into some other box. So for functions, is the output of a function. I now have, I apply a function f, and I get two outputs from it. And then I take one of these outputs, and I plug it into some function g. And this function also gives me two outputs. And then I plug one of them into function h, let's say. And this is kind of like, you can think of this as processing information step after step. But they don't have to be functions. I mean, they can be they can be linear maps, they can be matrices, they can be vectors or row vectors, column vectors. I mean, whatever really you want to, depends on the application. As I said, the basic principle is that you can wire them, and the only thing that matters is the way they're wired, nothing else. So you can move the boxes around. So if I take this particular diagram and I redraw it, hopefully remembering what it looked like. like that. Now, the only things that I have to keep fixed just for bookkeeping purposes are the inputs and the outputs overall, because I want to think of this as, as a derived box, if you will. You can always say, OK, now I've made, I have my diagram. I have my recipe for constructing this bigger physical process or this larger, more complicated function. And now I want to wrap it into a box on its own. So I can always just imagine that this has, I'm going to change uh, colors here for that clarity. You can imagine that this has a box around it and you're peeking into that larger box and you're looking at the recipe. So because you can imagine that there is a larger box around, you have to keep some things fixed. The inputs and the outputs, the order that they have is typically relevant. Now, there are some examples where this is not the case, but for the vast majority of processes, you want to know if you pass the first argument to the function or the second argument to the function, you have to remember the order of arguments that you pass. Like when you define a function and then you define a more complicated function using simpler functions, you sort of have a list of arguments that those are the wires. Except that in this formalism, there's not just one output, you are allowed as many outputs as you want. So it's a slightly more flexible formalism, but many programming languages allow you to return an array or a tuple of results, and that's the same. So here you're just saying, I take a a list of inputs, and those I want to remember where they are. I have a list of outputs. Those I need to remember where they are. But everything else in this box is free for me to move. So I can shift the boxes. 
And as long as the connections remain the same, as long as the wires are attached to the same places, the semantics of this doesn't change. Because, I mean, the, the position of the box on the piece of paper is irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is the information as to which output went into which input. And that's pretty much it. So I can really say this diagram is the same diagram, and I will write equal. And equal here means it's the same, not necessarily the same on the paper. The paper description is just a picture of what the abstract diagram is. It's the same as a diagram uh, as, say, a diagram where I have F here and I move G to the right and I move uh, H. I keep H here, let's say, and then I, so let's see, this goes here, uh, this goes here, this goes here, uh, this one goes here, uh, output one, output two, that. So that's the same diagram. What I've done is I have just shifted G to the right. Yes. That's the point. It says so far shifting up and down would also be allowed, but I assume that's it. No, it isn't. I, I just it's just at the moment that I shift any of this diagram up and down, I'm gonna introduce a bend in the wire and I'll have to explain my way out of that, which is perfectly fine, but I wanted to do it on a second slide to say, okay, now you can do some simple things. So with the idea that what we are doing is diagrams, really there are two basic moves that you have to consider. You have to be able to put things next to each other in parallel and you have to put, be able to put things in sequence. And then everything else in this diagram really is a composition of those. So I'm gonna take this diagram, I'm gonna break it down into a bunch of basic pieces, and then I'm gonna talk, start talking about those basic pieces. So let's take a, again, this, actually let's take a simpler diagram. Let's take a diagram that has two boxes, uh, one, two, like this and I'm going to wire it as simply as I can so I'm gonna no twists no nothing just a just a simple excellent so let's take that diagram for example this really this doesn't have any any wires crossing just to keep things simple for now uh, but you can think of it as a bunch of processes that have been composed in sequence and in parallel. So it's a fairly simple picture. And um, really, you just have to take this and imagine that, for example, there's a slice there, a slice there, a slice there. Uh, and these are just all processes in sequence. I've just applied them to different wires. There is no parallel here. I first did G on one of the inputs. Then I did F on the second input. Then I applied H to the first two inputs. And then I applied K to the third input. It's the same as saying in uh, that I define a function. Please write. Thank you. Define. Uh, I know what I want to call it. I'm going to call it A. So it's the same as saying that I've defined A. A takes three inputs to it. So let's say I1, uh, or let's call them ABC, XYZ, maybe better x y z uh so x y and z and then i said that doing a is really applying g to y so y is equal to g of y uh, x is equal to f of x uh h uh, sorry uh x y x comma y is equal to h of x comma y and uh z is equal to k z and then imagine that I return x, y, and z, something like that. Yes? That's only for the example, but there's no necessary correspondence between the output. A very good point. So let me just relabel things uh, appropriately. Uh, this is S and I'm gonna call this T and I call this ones Y oh no, uh, underscore Y underscore X, something like that. And then I recur return S and T. Yes, it doesn't matter. They can be anything. The, really I was more focusing on the fact that here I'm applying these boxes in sequence and that's it. But 
I can take the same exact diagram and say, does it really matter that I applied uh, K after H? Is it relevant? No, of course it isn't. Uh, it is actually, maybe I can do something smart here. It doesn't matter because K is not dependent on anything that was done to the other systems. I am applying it to this wire, this wire labeled Z on the right, nothing else happened before. So I can push it down or up and do it at any stage. So I could, for example, say, no, actually, I changed my program. I keep the same inputs, but I will do H at the same time of G. And so what I get is something a bit more weird, I guess. But, uh, I both apply G on Y and H on Z here, and I get two more systems. And this is G on Y and H on Z, something like that. And now I can say, actually, look, F is also independent of what G and H do. So I can pull F down and I can make it parallel. I can say, actually, F can be applied below. And this diagram is also equivalent, again, to the previous one. Now I am applying everything in, in parallel, in a sense. So I'm going to take the uh, this three. I'm going to add X here. And I'm going to shift this to the right, make some space. Yeah. And this becomes F, X, G, H. And now I don't have this operation. And now really I have one, two blocks left in my entire diagram, a block at the bottom, which consists of the parallel composition of three processes, and then a second block, which consists of H. But I also have this weird wire that flows upwards, I'm just saying I'm doing nothing to the third variable, it's just going up. So you can't really think of this as you can do things in parallel and if they don't have any dependency, you can push them up or down, the order doesn't matter. And indeed you don't have to, you can think of them as blocks in this way. This tells you something about the algebraic structure that's in the mathematics underneath the diagrams. And it's important if you do research on this stuff, for example, and you want to make new formalisms, but you don't have to. There are results by people who put a lot of time in this. Uh, for this particular formalism, it's mostly Joy Allen Street, two category theorists, uh, that say that all of these rules about what you can exchange in parallel composition, how you can twist things, really are captured by this idea that you can put boxes on a piece of paper, connect them, and as long as the connectivity doesn't change, anything you can do is valid. And in particular, you can move outputs below inputs. So you can start with something like this. So let's start with the simple one. So if you have two processes in parallel, you can always write them in parallel because it's just a statement that you can either do one after the other or vice versa and you get the same result, right? So you can do something like this. You can always just shift things around slide, as we say, this is a sliding uh, property. But you can also take processes that are in sequence. And you can move them. Sometimes it is convenient to rearrange things to apply more rules. And you can say, actually, I really want to think of it as F and G. But there's a end of wire that does something like this. That's also legit. Now, the physical interpretation of that bend of wire is an interesting point. It's going to be the example that I talk about today. Um, but the, for now, just think, in terms of diagrams, having a diagram where you move things around is legitimate. So you can do this. Now, what is this for a function? That's, a, that's something that we can discuss. But uh, there is semantics for moving diagrams around. Yes? It is. Ah, correct. How does that happen? Indeed. So it's because you're thinking that you're thinking of the semantics of this in terms of I have a function, I apply it to an input, I get an output, I apply it to the next one. I can tell you that if you have a diagram that doesn't have any loops at any point where you can never have any loops then you can always give it the semantics in that form because all you have to do, so I'll give you a slightly more complicated diagram, okay? Uh, where there are 
three boxes and they have their inputs, but one of them has an output like this. Then there's something here, something here. Uh, actually, let's do this, something like that, okay? Now this has this band of wire and you might think, okay, does it, why does it make sense if, if something comes out of F, how can F happen after G? Now, it happens after G if you order it like this because you're giving it meaning by saying, I imagine that it's coming after and there are situations where you will see this makes sense. But in general, you don't really have to, to compute the value. You don't have to necessarily think of it in time. That's just your imagination. All you have to do is make sure that the outputs are always produced after the inputs. So you start from the inputs and you say, okay, I, something flows into F and goes here, and then it goes here. And then whatever went here sort of goes down the band and enters here. And then like this, like this, like this, like this. So really it's all that matters is that you can go from the inputs to the outputs without ever having to have a loop. And then you can compute the values of things the usual way. That's not necessary though, because sometimes it is interesting to take, for example, fixed points of functions. You might want to say the same value, I take only the values in input that produce themselves in output, like in some kinds of recursion that becomes important. And then it's interesting to be able to write diagrams that have loops, so something like this, where you say, whatever I put in is the thing that comes out. So this is the same as saying that you apply F you are, let's say that this is X, this is Y, and let's call these S and T. And you're saying that you're considering uh, Y is F of X, S, actually, I guess Y, T is F of X, S, subject to T is equal to S. So for a fixed point of this function. You want to write something like that, you can write it with, the, with this loop and that has, has its own diagrammatic meaning. And you get a lot of nice properties of these fixed points by just thinking of, I connected an input to an output. Now, does that make physical sense? It depends on the application again. There are some applications where you want to take traces as we call them, uh, but some applications where it is sort of beyond, it's something Im imaginary that is helpful to do calculations, but not necessarily of physical meaning. And I think that's an important point that we'll have to revisit throughout these lectures, that not all you write down as physical meaning. But this is no different than linear algebra. Not every vector of complex numbers that you write down has physical meaning. Not every matrix, not every linear ma map has physical meaning. Some of them are unitary and you say, these are processes that can happen. Some of them are not unitary. And you might say these mean nothing, or you might say, actually, I know a bit more about uh, density matrices. And I know that these linear maps happen to be helpful to describe some probabilistic processes. And that's also useful as a building block, but not necessarily physical. So the interpretation we put on this diagram is something for our own bookkeeping. It's, it's our own mind trying to read something in the diagrams. The diagrams themselves, their semantic is purely mathematical. It's, it's a way of doing calculations of some kind and they have a fairly high expressive power. So you can have slightly more than what you then use them for. So some special boxes, sorry. Did you... no, oh no. no. I have questions, but at the well, they were there. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, but if you want to ask them in the middle, I mean, I'm happy to answer them now. If you have, well, I mean, maybe for for the students. I mean, if there is an assumption for the going here, yeah, that there is a tensor plus the composition behind it. Huh. Okay. So I'm just making them aware of the things. So that's a good point. How do you tensor plot the composition of the quantum systems? Yeah, 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 that is so a very good the, point. The, yes. the point is that you may have electrons because we're talking about physical processes. Okay, so imagine these wires are electrons. Well, you need to be careful. What is that? So that's that's a good point. Just to become aware of that. So imagine that your wires are electrons. Well, actually, imagine that your wires are electrons and positrons. Why not? Feynman diagrams, always fun. Uh, this, you might think that it is sensible to think of this particular process or the two boxes that compose this process as individual boxes, right? They are, it's kind of correct, except it really is not entirely correct. So this has, is a box that has 
two particles coming in. One is an electron, one is a positron and has a photon going out. And the next box, at least the ties check. So that's good. Um, at least I didn't do anything too bad. Uh, the next one has a, a photon coming in and has an electron and a positron coming out. So there are wires with types and I checked the types match so I can connect them. That's good. That makes sense. Except really these two don't live in a tensor product. They live in a space that is a bit more complicated because you have some selection rules and these particles are linked in. So you're taking a slice. You can think of them in a tensor product, but you have to take a slice with specific properties and it's, uh, it has some complication. However, you can make this into a, you can make this into a diagram. It's something that takes a bit more, a bit more thought, but the, there are diagrams that there is a way of, of doing away with that particular issue, but it's not, it's yes, it's kind of, but not really, but it's not really equal. It's kind of the right idea, thinking that Feynman diagrams and boxes are the same, but there are, correctly, there are some complications. You, when you do these uh, boxes and you draw these diagrams, you're trying to think of there is some kind of independence between my particles. I am taking indeed a tensor product. So if you are from quantum information or quantum, okay, actually, I don't know what the background of, of students here is. How many of you are physicists? <laughs> How many of you are computer scientists? Okay, mathematicians, zero. Good, okay. kind of half. Okay, so physicists and computer scientists. For the physicists, this here that I drew is the same as taking the tensor product between the two maps and taking three wires or what, taking two wires, let's say for two Hilbert spaces H and K is the same as taking the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces, secret. But I don't want to think of the, yes, the tensor product is there, but I want to not think about it as much as possible because the tensor product has a lot of equations that govern its behavior. And instead of having to rewrite all of these, uh, all of these maps, linear maps using these equations, I want to try and use as much of the geometry as possible to simplify my calculations, because the purpose of this is to make it easier to do quantum mechanics, quantum information, quantum theory. Okay? So it's a bookkeeping exercise, if you will, but if you start with this and never learn tensor products, then it's, oh, well, if you start with this and then, and then learn tensor products, then this becomes your language and tensor products become the bookkeeping exercise. Um, it really depends what kind of algebra you want to do. But, uh, and here comes the slightly uh, interesting example. I can have something like this. I showed that there's these bands of wire. And I can really think, and I should really think that having a band of wire, the connectivity is just from the bottom to the top. So why is this, should this be equal to something like that? The answer is yes. In this particular framework, it is. In fact, it is in any, in any field of mathematics where this framework can be interpreted. And if it isn't, you can make it so. So you can take functions. In functions, this you, this you cannot do. There is no such thing as a cup and a cap in functions. I'll now tell you what this looks like in, tense, in quantum theory. But you might think, oh, set theory doesn't have it. And indeed, it's a bit confusing at first to think, oh, I have an output that I, I take the output out. And then how is it possible that I do the functions in parallel if one of them has the input that comes later? And the answer is you're no longer working in set theory, you're working in a slightly bigger formula than that allows you to do that because you can post select on things. And this is what will the example that we run now. But first, mathematically, you can look at the diagram on the left and actually I'll make a new slide. Uh, this is This is true, but just for the go from quantum background, you can think of this as a band of wire, and then you don't have to give it uh, like any, any further thought. Or you can say, oh, hang on, hang on. You told me that I can write this as parallel and sequential compositions of things. So what are the blocks? Maybe I'm cheating. Maybe I'm telling you things that are not true. So it's worth uh, showing you that this is the case. So this is a box. Again, start with a box outside. And then I say, OK, so I think of this as composition of these two pieces something like that. So really I have two, two building blocks here. I have a cap and I have a cup. And these are boxes on their own, in their own right. So I can 
So imagine that this is a special box and this is a special box that have a special property that I can use to imagine that they behave as bands of wire. Maybe they don't. In this case, they don't. Uh, what are they? Well, if you want to think of them in terms of linear maps, so as from the point of view of quantum theory or quantum mechanics, these are the one at the bottom is a state, right? There is nothing coming in and there's two things coming out. So it's, it's not normalized. It's not going to be normalized, but that's fine. Uh, but it is, it's a state on two qubits that has some kind of connection between the two qubits. I mean, so much of a connection, in fact, that I can simplify it in this, in this snake equation, in this bend of wire. So it must be an entangled state of some kind. In fact, it must be a maximally entangled state of some kind. And in fact, it is a very familiar maximally entangled state. It's the Bell state. So it's, this is just going to be one, zero, zero, one. And the other box, the cap, has two qubits that come in and nothing comes out. And it's not really true that nothing comes out. What comes out of it is some number, because again, this is a calculation tool. So the point of drawing these diagrams is that you're representing maps. When you compose things left and right and close the diagrams, then there's nothing in and nothing out. It's not that it disappeared, really. You got some the result of your calculation, which in the case of quantum theory is a complex number. You're trying to compute amplitudes, or if you do the density matrix formalism, it's a real number. You're trying to compute probabilities. And so here, this is a map that goes from two qubits to just a number. So it's a, it's a row vector, and it's just the adjoint of the other one. So it's one, zero, zero. This, if I wanted to, I could uh, take this particular picture and write down the matrices with the tensor power, yes? It's a bell state up to a factor, right? So the bell state is. This, because it has, good. So there are two wires coming out. There's nothing coming in. So it's a state on two qubits. That's just, okay, which state? I'm telling you it is defined to be the best state, yes. It, there is no way for you to know that that's the best state. I'm just, it is the best state. It's a notation for the best state up to a factor of one over root two. Yeah, you can't derive it in any way right now because there are no building blocks in this thing. I've not yet given you any equations that you can use to prove that this is the case. Later on, I'll introduce more ingredients and give you some equations, and then you can derive it on your own. Yeah, to be fair, can you derive it? Not really, but you can derive that. You can compute the results of measurements on it, so you can technically compute all the tomography on it, and therefore infer that it's the best thing. But yeah, in time. Let's start with the. Uh, if I just a, a, a proof that that this makes your life easier. When is the uh, end of the lecture? 10 o'clock, just, just checking. Um, prove that this makes life easier. I'm going to take this equation and show you that if you, you can either say, oh, this is just a wire, connectivity is the only thing that matters, therefore I can simplify it. Or if you don't believe it, you can, take the, you can write down the matrices that correspond to the various pieces. You can compose them in parallel in sequence and you can prove that this is the identity. And maybe it's uh, an exercise in figuring out how convenient this formalism is to do that proof for once, very briefly. Maybe it will also help understand some other things. So I have, uh, this is the state one, zero, zero, one, or the vector, I say, better to say vector than state. This is the identity matrix on a qubit, one, zero, zero, one. This is a row vector, one, zero, zero, one. And this is the identity one zero zero one. Okay, this entire, the bottom, is the tensor product of the two matrices or the Kronecker product of the two matrices. And so you can write it down as one zero zero one, one zero zero one, and there are zeros here. The top part is the Kronecker product as well, but the other way. So it is. The row vector first, Kronecker product, the identity, and it becomes 
one zero zero one six zero zero one zero zero one like that and now i have uh two by eight matrix at the bottom and eight by two matrix at the top i take their composition and i get uh, if you don't believe it i can so this is the first direction you can see that you only the only component that you pick up is the top left one then you do with this one you see that you don't pick any component up then you cut this one and compose it with the top again there is no, no one in common and no position and if you look at the bottom you get only the last component and so it's the identity matrix really but you in order to get the identity matrix you have to first expand them into this this very large uh very large matrices and compose them and of course you might say but why why did you do that obviously these were tensors we know better than just to take chronicle products of everything in parallel uh anybody familiar with the google quantum supremacy experiment in 20 yes or no maybe not in 2019 google made an experiment with their quantum computer saying that it they could reproduce up to like a very high noise but still reasonable noise the results of a very large circuit that could simulate a circuit up to noise because their machine is noisy, but on 53 qubits. And they had a fairly deep circuit on 53 qubits. There's a lot of gates in this circuit. And they said this would take, I don't know, 10,000 years to do on a classical computer, which is a very bold prediction. Um, and they published this in Nature. And within a week, someone from IBM said actually it would take two days. And within a year, somebody from uh, some institute in China uh, that proved that they could actually do it in a few minutes on their supercomputer. And a few months later, someone came and said, actually, because you have noise, we can cheat and cut some wires in the middle, and we can reproduce the same results on my laptop in two seconds. So that's been kind of disproven as a claim. The reason why this claim came where they came to this 10,000 years figure is because they were looking at their circuits, which are very weird and large. They have more than anything, they're large. They have 53 qubits, right? 53 qubits is two to the 53 components that doesn't fit into any computer. And even if it did, it's, it's a lot of memory. Um, but what they were doing is doing all of these chronicle products of their matrices. They're saying, you can simulate it how? You take the chronicle product of the matrices, one stage and the next stage and the next stage and you compose them in parallel sorry in sequence like that so you do matrix products and they were saying okay yes if you take into account how big our computers are today and how big they would have to be and you do some trade-offs it would take a long time but the reality is there is no need to compose things in parallel first and then in sequence you can contract them in the optimal way so here there are two ways of doing this you can either expand it or you can say i contract them here first and suddenly my I go from two from two by four and four by two to two by two, and that's it, and I'm done. So instead of doing first this, then this, then this, you can contract them in the middle and spare some time. And indeed, that's the basis of these simulation techniques. You can think of all of these circuits as tensor networks. And the fact that you're not thinking of them in sequence helps you. Because if you look at something that is fairly large. And I'm going to write some boxes here. Do it like this. Something like that. That's three qubits. It's uh, you can think of oh, first I do first I do this, then I do this, then I do this. So your calculations are on eight by eight matrices, which trust me, if you do it by hand every day for practical purposes, you get used to it, but it becomes a bit annoying. Uh, four by four is okay, I think. You can still recognize some structure in four by four, eight by eight starts being easy to make mistakes. 16 by 16, I mean, who wants to write 256 complex numbers every stage of a calculation? I'm not sure. Uh, obviously, you don't want to do that. Uh, instead, what you do is you observe that there are better ways of contracting this particular tensor because you know it's you can take the first these two first and contract them here and you've not changed the size of your tensor at all you still have the, some those outer legs then you contract these and these 
and these, and only at the end you can contract. So you get a sort of tree of, of sequential contractions and you can ask which is the order of contractions that optimizes my calculation. That's the one I do, the one that makes my life easier. And the rules of these diagrammatic calculi that I will introduce help you do that on paper. So instead of having it, of course, you could put all of these into a computer, you take a library like Kotengra and you ask what is the optimal way or can you do it within this much memory or this much time and you get an answer. But if you're a researcher, you don't necessarily always want to go to the computer and do the simulation numerically because I mean, it, it's, it's a bit inconvenient sometimes and also doesn't really give you an intuition as to what's going on. So instead, what you want to do is have some rules that allow you to simplify this diagram without having to do the calculation. And so, for example, you might want to be able to say, actually, in this case, this diagram simplifies to something like this. And then you might want to say that, well, actually, I can sort of push this one in. And it becomes something like this. Some of these simplify. You can, I don't know what this does effectively. I think I picked a random example, but you can do calculations by hand until something pops up. I'll pick this back when I actually have the rules to discuss. But going back to boxes, okay, so we have this equation that tells you that you don't really care about these bands of wire. What their meaning is is a different point, but you don't care about the bands. So you can just the connectivity is all you care about. Uh, you have this rule that says that you can reorder things vertically. Um, these tell you something about the structure of your processes. Um, now, what, what's what's left? Well, there's two special boxes. There's I've told you that there are there's a special kind of box that. I'm going to use a Greek letter for this. Uh, special kind of box that doesn't have anything in and only has outputs. So, for example, it's there's nothing here. In fact, there's just the scalars here, and there are a bunch of systems here. And this is going to be a state up to a normalization factor typically. So, states are a recipe to produce things. There's nothing more to them. A state is the recipe that you use to produce uh, a state. Because this is about the recipe, it's not about the value underneath. There is no value underneath. Remember that all you, you have to shift your you have to shift your perspective and say, I, I don't want to know that this is a complex number. I don't want to know that this is a state in a quantum computer. I want to just know that this is the recipe that I use. And indeed, if you do quantum computing, you start thinking that states are really just their recipes. Because if you want to say, my computation starts with a bell state tensored with a plus state, typically your quantum computer starts with zero states on all the wires. And really your starting state is the description of how you go from the standard zero states into your desired starting state. You don't, there is no way for you to, there is no standard ways for you to say, I want my computation to start on the bell state times the plus state. Because in general, that means nothing. Right? Who knows how to construct the general state? It's hard. It's not easy. So you just say, okay, really, what is the state? The state is the recipe that starts from the zeros. Uh, and then you apply the necessary gates to produce the state. And in this formula, we don't have to distinguish between the two notions because they are the same. You can say, oh, okay, so what is the initial state? It's a, it's a diagram. Or you can say, actually, the initial state is the box that produces the state. You just box it up. You forget about what the about the recipe that was inside. Sometimes you don't even think about it. You're like, oh, whatever is inside, I don't care. It is the recipe that gives me the thing that I want. And then there's transformations. But more importantly, there's a special kind of box that this makes things disappear into nothing, apparently. But it doesn't really, because again, this is not physics. This is a calculation tool. And it's boxes that have something coming in, but nothing coming out. And these are the these are bras. They are costates or row vectors or however you want to think of them. They are a recipe to transform a state, whatever state is in those wires, into a complex number. That's what you get and in fact the complex number is going to be something like the bracket that 
So really, if you look at bracket notation, for example, and this was the inspiration for a lot of our, our initial uh, our initial notations, well, not our, I guess, the initial notations of the people who worked on this in the early 2000s, they realized that composing two of these, a state and an effect, gave you a complex number. And the complex number is really this complex number. And so they started denoting, and this notation kind of holds to date in some works. They started denoting the states, like some of them denoted them with triangles. I find them a bit annoying to write. Uh, the states and effects with triangles that kind of like look like the bracket notation. If you rotate them by 90 degrees, uh, you get bracket notation. But you don't want to write them like bracket notation because bracket notation proceeds right to left. And it's kind of hard to for pretty much anybody else to read things going right to left. But if you want, you can make your diagrams go right to left. Quantum circuits go left to right. Why is one of the states dry? It depends on the because you fixed an order. It's not they're not both states. The state is the one that goes from nothing to something, and the bra is the one that goes from something to complex number. It's the result of a measurement. So they, there is a direction. In our way of interpreting this, there is a direction. In the diagram itself, there isn't one. But when we read it, we think, what is this? If you want to imagine what this is describing physically, we think, oh, okay. So this is, uh, I start with a state, I apply, uh, I apply something and there's nothing left, but there is an amplitude that describes how likely the process is to happen and so on and so on. So let me give you a practical example, which is naive teleportation, which I think is, uh, interesting in itself and say that you start you have two parties it's called the malice and bob for traditional reasons and they start by sharing a bell state so somewhere in the past they came together did something and went back to their own homes with a flask containing a qubit each and these qubits are now entangled they're maximally entangled so there is one qubit goes to alice one qubit goes to Bob. They do stuff, and then Alice ends up with one qubit, Bob ends up with one qubit. Then they go very far away, or not far away, who cares? They go home. They go, they're not in the same place, really. So they cannot put the qubits together. And then suddenly, Alice uh, inherits, comes into possession of a really interesting qubit in some unknown state. She doesn't really know what the state is. Uh, she wants Bob to have it, but... Uh, Bob can't really come to pick it up at her home. So she has to figure a way of making it so that Bob has this qubit without actually bringing it. Maybe it's stuck somewhere, like it's in a, in a closet. Uh, but may, she can still bring her flask to the qubit and do some stuff. Like she has good quantum equipment in her house, don't we all? Um, so ideally, she would like to do something like this. She would like for the universe to, for things in the universe to conspire in such a way that a cat happens, whatever that means. Why? Well, because if, if she can make it so, then what the result of this operation is that the state, I can strengthen the, straighten the wire, and pull it top, like this, and then I can slide it up, like this, and I'll put some separators in a second. Alice and Bob. So if she can convince the universe to perform this operation, whatever it is, then the effect, and here is where the calculation comes into play, the effect is the same as making it for her state, which she cannot reproduce in any way because quantum states can be cloned, uh, but her state will appear in Bob's house. In fact, it will appear in Bob's flask. The qubit in Bob's flask or whatever quantum system Bob had in his flask will now be in the state that Alice found in her closet. That's the idea. Now, the only question is, what is that process? Can, can Alice make it happen in any way? Does this calculation keep something from us? Um, what's going on? So that process cannot be made to happen for sure. And here's the, the word sure comes into play. There are some boxes that we can make happen physically, that we can coerce the universe to do, 
those we can call shore boxes, let's say, just to pick a simple name. And there are boxes that we cannot coerce the universe to do, but maybe will happen as part of some larger physical process. And we can call them maybe boxes, let's say. An example of a sure box is, well, this. We know of a process that consistently produces a bell state. Well, then some, someone from experimental physics might come and tell us that uh, the, we don't know of a process that, that consistently produces a bell state. And in some applications, this is true. But uh, ideally, we know that we can convince the universe. In an ideal universe where there is no noise and our equipment is perfect, we can convince the universe to give us a bell state. That, again, some philosophers would debate that that's not true, but let's, let's say that for practical purposes it is. Um, you have a bell state. You can say, I have a bell state. That's okay. We all say. Um, what you can't do is make the universe do this. What you can do is you can make the universe do that or that or that or that. So the universe will make one of four things, it turns out. There is a process that we can do that results in one of four things. One of them is good. The other ones are not so good. Well, it turns out we can fix it, but they're not so good. They definitely don't do what we wanted. So this is a maybe box. It's a box that we can maybe do, maybe not. In overall, all of these boxes form a test. They, they form a measurement. In fact, they are the outcomes of one measurement. It's the outcomes of the bell measurement, to be precise. And this is the cat for the one of the four bell states. And then there are the cats for the other four bell states. And it turns out that uh, we can do this right and you can underst we can understand how to fix it when four things happen. Typically, they have different probabilities. Each of them happens with a probability of one quarter in this particular, in this particular example. So this will have probability one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. So 25%. So about 25% of the time, Alice will be successful and the other 75% of the time, Alice will not be successful. What happens when she's not successful? So what happens is if she convinced, she asked the universe to do this, as if she did a bell measurement on her qubits, but she didn't get the right thing. She got something else. Uh, so what can she get? And does it matter? Does it completely break the experiment or can she do something to fix it? So imagine that she introduced some kind of error on the wire. And now I can do something new. I can take that error and give you a new, a new piece of information, which is that you can slide boxes on wires. So I, I, because the only thing that matters is connectivity, as long as you remember that you rotated the box in some way, then it's fine. That's why I started drawing the boxes with these trapezoidal shapes, which are not invariant under rotation, because rectangles are, but trapezoids are. So you can say, actually, there are, I can take a box, any box, and if I have a bend of wire, I can rotate it along like a bead. You can slide a bead along a length of wire. You can slide a box along the length of wire and it appears on the other side. But it's not the same box. It's a box that's related to it. Let's see, I have the pointy bit that changed position. So really what I've done is I have rotated the box 180 degree in the rotation. You can do that. Or if you don't like the idea of, of doing that, you can put uh, an explicit notation that your box has been transposed. So this is the transpose of the matrix, if you will. So depending on your on your personal preferences, uh, some I think it's intuitive to have this sort of rotation with the with the shape that remembers it. And it turns out in the practical applications, I'll show all of the boxes are self transposed, so you will not even have to care about that. But if you want to remember what's happening, it's just you put a T on top of it and you transpose things. Uh, good, so we can do that for now. We get a different box. 
still a valid box, a legit box. Uh, if you want to uh, be a bit more precise about it, you might say, hang on, Stefano. You didn't tell us that we could rotate boxes. Are you cheating here? I am not. You can take your box and you can define a new box just using diagrammatic elements that makes the transpose. And the transpose is the output goes into the input and the input goes into the output. And sorry, if you want to make it look like the original one, you reorder the wires a little. So this goes like this, this goes like that. And now you repackage it into a bigger box, which has the correct shape, I presume. And you say that this is the definition of this weird rotated box. You can, because any, any diagram can be packaged into a box and reused. It's, uh, you just define new notation. You define an operation that takes a box and gives me the transpose. And the transpose is defined to be that thing there. Now you can say, actually, does this, does this truly satisfy my, the property that I wanted? And you can prove it. So just with the diagrammatic axioms, just with the axioms of calculus, you can prove that if you have, let me make some space. Uh, if this is your definition of what a transpose does, then you take your, uh, let's take this and put a band of wire. Now I replace it, and this is the part of the fun. You can cut and paste things. So you can say this part here matches this part here. So I replace it with the other one. And I get same wires, but inside I draw this other box. Like that. And now these two that I had, uh, I can sort of pull because this is a, a band of wire. So this becomes something like this. because of the snake equation. So I've done, I've just used the fact that this thing here is the same as just, it's the snake equation is just looped around rather than snaky like this, but this, the connectivity is the only thing that matters. And now I can say, oh, look at my, my F is on the left. It's kind of looks weird because there's this swap, but I can just move it to the right. And if I slide it across this wire, I get, this, which is what I wanted to prove. So yeah, this is truly, the transpose truly slides along the wire. So this, it does behave like a bead, but I just introduce a new notation and I use this, uh, this wiring, only the wiring or only topology matters or these snake equations, how you want to see it to prove that it behaves as if it's slid across the band. But really, you don't have to slide anything. You can just define notation for it. So now that we know that we can do transposes, let's, uh, let's look at this again. And now this is no longer equal for now. Uh, we will fix it in a second. What is it equal to? Well, I can take this band. I can take this box and I can slide it along the band. And then I can, again, pull the wire stop. What I'm left with is a small error on the way. So I'm left with the transpose of this. Actually, I should probably, where do I want to draw it? Let me just redraw everything. So first things first, I can start again with the same state. I can slide my box down to the other side. Like that. And then I can pull the wire stop again, and I'm left with that. And I can again pull things up all the way to the top, and I'm left with that. So I don't have the same state, unfortunately. I have a different state. That's not good, because it makes the protocol fail. Alice did not successfully teleport 
this is called teleportation. Obviously, there's no teleportation involved in anything. It's just the state gets transferred in some way, but she didn't manage. The, in one out of four cases, so 25% of the time, she succeeds at transferring the state to Bob. 75% of the time, she fails, but she can make a phone call. She can say, look, Bob, I, I mean, I'm sorry. It didn't come out the way I wanted, but it was one of the other three outcomes. So as long as the information about which outcome happened is transferred to Bob by some means, so what is E? It's something. As long as you transfer that information, then Bob can apply something on the other side that perhaps fixes it, perhaps. And the question is, what is that something? And that's the last ingredient we talk about today. First things first, there has to be a way of transferring information. You have to somehow, Alice has to somehow tell Bob that the error happened, that one of the three errors happened. So if Alice is very far away and Alice and Bob are at opposite ends of the solar system, let's say, to keep it real, not opposite ends of the galaxy, which seems a bit excessive, um, then the state cannot be teleported really. There is no teleportation happening in that sense. Uh, you, it doesn't instantaneously happen. It cannot violate the laws of causality. It doesn't break relativity. There's no superluminal signaling, if you will. It's, a, it's just a misunderstanding because you still need to send some classical information over for the, trans, for the teleportation to happen without error. And then you could ask, oh, well, maybe it happens with error, but the error still carries information. And the answer is no. <laughs> The error carries no information whatsoever. What, uh, what Bob sees is the maximum mixed state, and there is nothing that he can do about it. But if there is a bit of communication, which is the thing that saves the laws of relativity in a sense, it wouldn't be consistent with the laws of relativity if you didn't have to send something across, then what we can do is we can take our box, the error box that we had, and flip it. Flip it upside down. And maybe, in this case, it is, it is true, uh, this is a box that can be inverted by its, by its flipped version. And so there are two possible ways of writing that inversion. I can either invert it from the top or from the bottom. Right? If I only have one of them, then this box is known as an isometry. And if I have two of them, then this box is known as a unitary. Why? Because if this is any linear map, so let's say from n dimensions to m dimensions, then the thing on the right is its adjoint. Uh, if this went from n to m, this goes from m to n. So it's truly flipped upside down and it's the adjoint. The adjoint is not necessarily the inverse in general. It is if, if, a, uh, if a box is inverted by its adjoint on the left, then that's called an isometry. If it's inverted by its adjoint on both sides, then that's the unitary. So unitaries are, unitaries satisfy both of these flipped cancellation equations from the top. It doesn't really matter which direction. Isometries are the one that satisfy one, but not the other. Uh, in particular, quantum states are isometries. That's an observation that I think is, is helpful. Um, if you take any state, any bra, right? And you apply its adjoint at the top. So let me write it with a little, with a little trapezoid to remember that this is the case that, then this is the cat. Sorry, if it's any cat, sorry, that's the bra. And the overall diagram is the bra cat. And if the state is normalized, this is just one. So this is in particular an example. If you have a state, you produce, you come from nothing, you produce the state, you apply its own bra, 
what you get is the scalar one, so it's the identity. So states are examples of isometries, but there are plenty of isometries. The cop like the coherent copy in a basis is an isometry. We'll talk about it tomorrow when I introduce some more ingredients. But just to conclude the, the teleportation example. So this is indeed what, what Alice does. She tells Bob about the error. Bob applies the inverse for the error. So corrects the error, as they say. So this is the error and this is the correction and for the correction to happen bob has to know which error happened otherwise he cannot apply the correct box and then this bit at the top is actually just the original state and everybody's happy again so bob now is in possession of the state that alice had in her closet and the entire protocol just to give you a preview for what happens tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to do this properly, but given that I have five minutes, I'm just going to very briefly sketch it. Uh, the way that it works is you don't really have to even specify what state Alice has. You can say for any state that Alice has, this will work. So really what you wanna prove is that you have some snake equation, but perhaps with some error in the middle and some correction at the top, and you want to prove this Uh, sorry, I did. Da, da, da. I think I rotated it the wrong way, the other way. And you want to prove that this is just the identity. So teleportation is just a statement. But you can write it down explicitly, as you would. Uh, you can say, actually, what I have is something like this. Uh -huh. So this is a pi, b pi, and then b pi, a pi, and this is just identity. So you tomorrow will get something closer to to this picture. In fact, I think I will want to be. Uh, yeah, that's fine for now. And this is going to be the recipe of teleportation and tomorrow I will prove to you that this indeed corresponds to the building blocks that we had before. The, this at the bottom is going to be just a cup. This at the top is going to be a cap, possibly with some error. And that this thing on the right is going to be the correction for that error. So this is good. I'm going to take teleportation tomorrow as I drew it with just this, this derata, if you want. I, I have some pieces that are abstract. I know that maybe I will, I have a maybe box, so I might get an error out of it. Uh, I know I want this cup so that I can get the snake equation to do the teleportation for me. And I know that I want to write the correction in some way. So I will start with just the abstract boxes, not knowing what they look like inside, and then use the new building blocks that I introduced tomorrow, which is spiders, to fill these boxes in so to provide the implementation again this is much like writing a program but the other way than usual usually you start from the program you imagine what the program should look like at the end and you go line by line filling it in and then you make bigger boxes and bigger boxes and bigger boxes now imagine you do it the other way you start by writing the functions that you want with their inputs and outputs and then at the start they have nothing in and then you start saying i want it to do this and you start filling in the details so you start from the top, you write the functions first, and then you fill in the recipe instead of going from the bottom up. It's just a different shift. Good. I think we are done for today. That's all I wanted to talk about. I'll see you at two o'clock. Yes. And I mean, I'll be there a bit earlier. So we have the room from one to four. Yes. But the lecture is from two to four. Mm. And we can stay more in yeah, you All can. Right, I'm gonna post this later today. Fantastic. All right, I'll see you later on.